Hi students, welcome or welcome back. This is Professor Schimmeld, uh, Crafton Hills College, and today I'm going to talk to you about Chapter 4, which is entitled Functional Anatomy of Prokaryotic and Eukaryotic Cells. Let me clarify, I'm going to lecture on prokaryotic cells and you guys are going to read about eukaryotic cells. You'll find a reading assignment in Blackboard in the uh, material for lecture exam one, so uh, download that and uh, that's the material that you are responsible for regarding eukaryotic cells for the uh, lecture exam. So let's go ahead and get started. On the first page of your outline, you have a table, which is a comparison of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. All right, let's take a look at that. First of all, the word prokaryotic means pre-nucleus. This is a reference to the fact that prokaryotic cells lack a nucleus and other organelles. Uh, what I mean is, is that their genetic information is not separated from the rest of the cell by means of a nuclear envelope, and they don't have any other um, highly organized organelles like mitochondria and chloroplasts, for example. Uh, these organisms are also referred to as prokaryotes, and uh, the terms prokaryotic or prokaryote are synonymous with the term bacterium. All right, eukaryotic, that word means true nucleus, and this would be um, organisms whose cells are uh, eukaryotic in nature, that means they have a true nucleus, they have other organelles, such as the ones I mentioned a moment ago. Okay, now as far as what are the two cell types made of, well, they're made of the same materials. Both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells are made of um, carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids, and proteins. It's just um, how much and how those materials are arranged. Those are going to um, account for the differences that we see in those two cell types. Um, already mentioned, the third point, prokaryotic cells lack a nucleus and organelles. Eukaryotic cells do have those structures. Uh, now, I'm not going to get into a detailed discussion of what a histone protein is. Uh, I'll just say briefly, it is a, um, a category of protein that's associated with the um, um, organization, structural organization of DNA in eukaryotic cells into chromosomes, all right? And we never find histone proteins in prokaryotic cells, and we always find histone proteins in eukaryotic cells. The bacteria or the prokaryotes, they are unicellular. And um, eukaryotic cells, there are some uh, organisms that are just made of a single eukaryotic cell, like uh, yeast and the protozoans, for example. And then other eukaryotic organisms are multicellular. We'll talk more about that at another, um, on another, uh, in another session, sorry. Um, all right, so the bacteria, they, um, for the most part, there are exceptions, but for the most part, the bacteria have a cell wall. And there are different types of cell walls, gram-positive cell walls and gram-negative cell walls, and then other bacteria referred to as being acid fast. We'll talk more about that later in this lecture. Uh, but the cell wall, if it is present, is a semi-rigid structure. And uh, with the um, exception of bacteria that are classified in a large taxonomic group called a domain, the domain archaea, um, other bacteria other than those in domain archaea contain either a little or a lot of a substance called peptidoglycan. Uh, again, more on this in, in a few minutes. Now, that peptidoglycan, it is unique to prokaryotic organisms and we'll never find peptidoglycan in eukaryotic cells. All right, uh, the reproduction of the prokaryotes is by a very simple process called binary fission. Uh, one parent cell divides into um, ideally two identical daughter cells. Eukaryotic cells use a more complicated um, method to reproduce themselves called mitosis, and it involves um, organelles, I guess you could say, such as centrioles and um, definitely an organelle and spindle fibers and um, other structures are involved in mitosis in eukaryotic cells. All right, now as far as classification of these organisms is concerned, and when I'm referring to classification, I'm talking about taking this great diversity of life that we have on planet Earth and dividing it into groups, and these uh, groupings, or um, taxa means category, these groupings reflect relationships between the organisms. All right, well, the first division, 
would be into um, three groups uh, called domains. The bacteria, there are so many bacteria that they actually um, are going to encompass two domains, domain uh, bacteria, also known as eubacteria, true bacteria, and also domain archaea, or the ancient ones. And then eukaryotic cells are classified into a domain called eukarya. Uh, now, eukarya is going to be further broken down into the, uh, the next group below domain is called a kingdom. Four kingdoms, they are known as um, fungi, protista, animalia, and plantae. We'll take a closer look at this later. The bacteria, the prokaryotes, are uh, believed by most to be the first forms of life on planet Earth, and then it is also believed that um, all other forms of life evolved from the bacteria. All right, so there's a comparison of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Uh, let's go ahead now and take a look at uh, the size, shape, and arrangement of bacterial cells. We're going to concentrate on the bacteria or the prokaryotes for the rest of this lecture. By the way, I expect this is going to be a two, maybe a three-part lecture. All right, size, shape, and arrangement of cells. We have three basic shapes when we talk about bacteria, shapes or morphologies. Uh, the first would be round bacterial cells. They are known as cocci. Coccus, C-O-C-C-U-S would be the singular form of the word, and uh, C-O-C-C-I would be the plural form of the word. Now, there are a number of different ways in which cocci can be arranged, and I believe you have some, uh, some diagrams you do in your, um, in your uh, outline. And so you can see uh, sometimes uh, we may just have um, individually scattered, I'm talking about when we view microscopically, individually um, scattered against our, um, our background of um, cocci, loosely scattered, no particular arrangement. Sometimes the vast majority of cells will um, form pairs. We call those uh, diplococci. Um, Grape-like clusters or clusters of round cells are called staphylococci. Cocci may also be arranged in chains. We call those streptococci. Now, um, we may have a tetrad of cells, which would be um, four cells um, in, in a, a, arranged in a square shape. And then if you take um, two of those tetrads and sort of glue them together, then you have a, um, an eight-cell cube called a sarcinia. All right, now the next morphology that we see in the prokaryotic cells are called bacilli. Bacillus, singular, bacilli, plural. Um, and, oh, by the way, I didn't talk about the, um, the size of bacilli, um, excuse me, cocci, couple three microns in diameter. They can be larger, definitely. They may possibly be smaller. All right, um, bacilli, they could be anywhere from uh, maybe two to six microns in length or longer. Um, some bacilli are going to be um, long and very thin. Others will be shorter and plumper. Uh, and we have some arrangements of bacilli possible, not as many as we see with the cocci, but uh, the bacilli may be um, just um, loosely scattered individual cells against our uh, microscopic background, or we may see them arranged in pairs, diplobacilli, or in chains, streptobacilli. Um, I've seen some other arrangements uh, that um, some authors have referred to called um, palisades. It's like a, um, like a like a deck of cards, but um, how about we just not worry uh, about that particular arrangement of bacilli for now. We'll just go with the diplo and the streptobacilli. And you've got some um, photos in your handout that show us some um, different arrangements of bacilli. Um, bacillus megatherium, for example, large bacillus forms uh, strep formations. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, typically um, individually scattered cells. They are much smaller um, and uh, much shorter uh, proportionally than we saw with uh, Bacillus megatherium. Uh, and there are other possibilities. Okay, now some bacterial cells are um, twisted or bent or, um, or actually uh, twisted so far as to form a spiral. Let's talk about those. Uh, if we had just a, um, let's say, a long bacillus and we just sort of bent it. So we're going to see something that looks like this. That's referred to as a vibrio, all right? So that's one possibility. 
uh, and cells that are twisted enough to have at least one complete turn, they are referred to as spirilla. Spirillum would be the singular form of the word. And spirilla, they tend to have um, rigid cell walls and so not a lot of flexibility there. And then another possibility uh, of a, um, a twisted or bent uh, cell would be what's known as a spirochete. So we have a, um, a helical cell and um, not as rigid a cell wall. Um, these are typically um, gram negative uh, and so not so much peptidoglycan. And then there is this um, um, kind of a thin flexible sheath that goes around the outside of the cell. If you take a look in your textbook, you'll see, or, or Google it online, you'll see a nice diagram. But in that flexible sheath, there are going to be one or more structures referred to as axial filaments. Now, uh, these axial filaments um, allow spirochetes to move, and we're gonna take um, a much closer look at axial filaments a little bit later on in this lecture. All right, we're still talking about um, morphologies. Uh, I went ahead and I separated out what we call cocobacilli. Um, I separated them from the, um, the true bacilli because they're very small, really short, kind of plump cells. Uh, they're just not quite perfectly round. It's like somebody took a caucus and kind of squished it, compressed it a little bit, so it's a little flattened on two sides. And um, true cocci, they are really, really perfectly round. And so you've got to look at these very carefully to see that, yeah, actually they are cocobacilli. And there's a picture of a bacterium that is, um, its cells are cocobacilli called Acinetobacter calcoiticus. Um, all right, let's go ahead and talk more about this. Uh, next on your um, outline is a bit of vocabulary, the term pleomorphic that uh, refers to having many shapes. Now, this refers to some bacteria whose cell wall maybe isn't as rigid. Uh, for example, there's a genus called Carini bacterium, causes disease like diphtheria, for example. And those cells are, um, I think they're technically described as being bacilli, uh, but they tend to be irregular. So if you looked at them on a microscope slide, some would be um, pretty distinct bacilli. Some might be um, kind of club shaped. I mean, um, larger, thicker on one end than on the other, but pleomorphic means having many shapes. And you've got some examples of pleomorphic bacteria in your outline, um, mycobacterium, uh, mycoplasma, that's a very tiny bacterium that naturally lacks a cell wall, and another bacterium that is a soil dweller named rhizobium. Those are all considered to be pleomorphic bacteria. All right, let's see where we are. All right, so we have made it to the parts of a typical prokaryotic cell, and you've got a, um, a diagram, I hope you can see this, uh, of a typical prokaryotic cell in your outline, so you might want to refer to this uh, as we continue this discussion. So uh, we are going to uh, look in detail at the parts of the prokaryotic cell, more detail in some cases than others, and um, we will begin with structures that lie external to the cell wall. Okay, so let's pick it up with what's known as the glycocalyx. Some bacteria have a glycocalyx, which implies that others do not, right? Uh, glycocalyx is a layer of sticky material made up mostly of um, polysaccharide, maybe a little polypeptide in there, surrounds the cell wall of some bacteria. And uh, it, uh, it, it serves as a number, or I should say it has a number of functions. Um, one is because it's sticky, it actually helps the bacteria to um, adhere to, to attach itself to surfaces like tissues of your body, for example. Um, it also helps to prevent the cell from desiccating, which means drying out. Uh, it uh, helps the cell avoid phagocytosis by the um, the white blood cells of our immune system. Uh, and those are just a few. I, I may uh, think of another function as I um, uh, continue this discussion, but that, that'll do for the moment. Um, anyways, this glycocalyx, it can be um, very, the material making up the glycocalyx, it can be very well organized and firmly attached to the cell, in which case we refer to it as 
a capsule. Now, capsules can contribute to pathogenicity. Pathogenicity refers to having the ability to cause disease. Um, all right, so what I mean by that is uh, bacteria that have a glycocalyx. Um, let's, let, let me use this as an example. I use this every semester. I think it kind of works. Anyways, I'm a contact lens wearer, all right? And I, um, like other contact lens wearers, I am forever putting my finger in my eye to adjust my contact. And I don't even realize I'm doing it. I've worn contacts for, I think, maybe 40 years now. And so here are my 10 inoculating loops, all right? Even if I just wash my hands, there are definitely bacteria on my fingers. And so every time I put my finger in my eye, I'm literally inoculating my eye with um, any organisms that might be on my fingertips. And now if some of those bacteria that I introduced to my eye had a capsule, they would be better able to attach themselves to the tissues of my eye and resist being washed from my eye by my tears, which is one of the functions of tears. So that's what I mean when I say that a capsule specifically can contribute to pathogenicity. Now, in other cases, the glycocalyx material is not well organized and it's just loosely attached to the cell, in which case we refer to it as being a slime layer. Slime layers don't really significantly contribute to pathogenicity. They're um, uh, not very firmly attached to the cell, so they're not going to be very efficient at helping the cell attach itself in any meaningful way uh, to surfaces. All right, uh, you've got examples of bacteria with a, um, with a capsule specifically in your notes. Uh, for example, Streptococcus pneumoniae and Klebsiella pneumoniae, and obviously those are two bacteria that cause uh, different um, forms of bacterial pneumonia. And there's a really nice um, capsule stain uh, photograph on the bottom of the page. Okay. Oh, I know there was something else that I wanted to tell you about. Um, the glycocalyx, um, is sometimes it's referred to as EPS. And let me make sure I get that right. That stands for extra uh, polymeric substance. Now, this type of glycocalyx, slightly different organization, and um, the components making it up are slightly different than the glycocalyx I just spoke about. This EPS, it allows bacteria, bacteria of different species, to form what we call biofilms. I think you've probably heard of biofilms about now. Uh, we've been talking about them for um, the last several years in the scientific community. Uh, but anyways, biofilms are everywhere. For example, the, um, uh, the bottom of the shampoo bottle that's in your shower, kind of slimy, that's a biofilm. That nasty stuff that's um, uh, gunking up your uh, kitchen sink drain, biofilm. The nasty, filmy stuff on your teeth, biofilm. Anyway, this EPS, it plays several different roles. One, it helps the cells attach to their environment. Uh, it also um, helps the cells attach to each other. Various species uh, can be involved in a biofilm, not just one species. And uh, the biofilm um, helps protect the cells um, from uh, adverse conditions um, like um, being washed away by tears, being exposed to certain chemicals like disinfectants, um, etc. And um, also uh, allows the cells to communicate with each other very effectively. All right, so if you're not afraid of anything, you might consider being afraid of biofilms. They are a little bit scary. All right, let's see where we are. Okay, made it to the flagellum. Remember, we're still talking about structures that lie external to the cell wall. Uh, some bacteria have them. Uh, bacteria with flagella are modal. That means able to move. Uh, they are able to move through their environment. Um, if a bacterium has flagella, it may just have a, um, a single flagellum. And if you look in your outline, you can see that we refer to that arrangement as monotrichus, right? One flagellum. Uh, or there could be multiple flagella. And if you look in your notes, you'll see um, some bacteria will have a, um, a cluster of flagella located at one pole, one end of the cell. We refer to that as lophotrichus arrangement. Other bacteria have a cluster of flagella at attached to each pole of the cell. That's referred to as amphitrichus arrangement. And 
still another possibility for uh, arrangement of flagella is what we call paratrichous arrangement. And as you can see from the diagram, that's a bacterium that has flagella uh, pretty much evenly distributed around uh, the entire cell. Uh, now, more flagella equals faster, more efficient movement. And if you take a look in your, um, uh, your notes, you'll see that the bacterial flagellum, some facts about it is, uh, number one, it's uh, made of a protein called flagellin. And it's a hollow structure, so if you sliced it, um, you would see it's a, a tube of this protein flagellin made of three parts. Uh, the filament, that's the long whip-like part. Um, then there is a slightly thicker part that joins the filament to the basal body. That's called the hook, slightly different protein. And then the basal body, that's what is going to anchor the fl flagellum into the cell. Uh, and you've got a diagram there, but um, I went out to my, um, uh, my workshop and I found this um, uh, bolt and some washers to try to illustrate this. Uh, so why don't you think of the basal body as a bolt and washers, all right? And so um, uh, the number of washers that we have depends on whether or not it's a gram-positive or a gram-negative cell. And I'm going to talk about different bacterial cell wall types um, probably in the next lecture. But anyway, so take a look at this. Um, here is our gram-positive cell. It would have two of the washers. And as you can see from the diagram, actually they'd be closer together than that. Uh, those two washers are going to be embedded in actually the plasma membrane um, of that uh, bacterium. And then a gram-negative cell is going to have four of the washers, all right? And two of them will be embedded in the plasma membrane, and then two will be embedded in what we call the outer membrane portion of the uh, gram-negative cell wall. Okay, so anyways, back to the workshop with that. And let's go ahead and move on. Okay, we already talked about uh, arrangement of flagella. Now you'll see a photograph um, in your notes. I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this or not, but I'll hold it up anyways. And what you're looking at right here is a, um, a TSA plate, all right, a Petri plate containing triptych soy auger. And what we're doing is, is we are illustrating a phenomenon called swarming. Some highly modal bacteria, uh, when they are grown on the surface of a solid media, as they grow, the organism's growth will spread across the surface of the plate. That is called swarming. And sometimes you'll see, like you can in this photo, um, kind of a wave-like pattern of growth um, occur. Other times the growth will be perfectly smooth across the plate, but um, we're going to do this in lab, and so you'll get a chance to see this uh, close up. All right, we're getting a little long here in the video, so I'm going to go ahead and break, and we will um, pick up part two of this lecture with a discussion of axial filaments. Uh, thanks for watching. Oh, by the way, before I go... Hope you can read that. Okay, see you in a bit.